Hello everyone, my name is Michael SK and welcome back to Umineko When They Cry Episode 2. The game has truly begun once again, or the games, I guess you could say. In regards to this wacky mystery of where we're going to try and disprove a lot of the uh, the magical reasonings and such that'll probably pop up in this story more than the previous one in episode one, because we do have somebody here who has been self-inserted into the story that can just utilize magic before everyone's eyes. And with that now said, the first six deaths have occurred overnight, and this time around... It is of the parents minus Rosa. Rosa got away from this one. I don't know how, but I'm assuming that she's going to be taking a bit of a Nazi role in this one. But it really does beg the question, you know, if we do want to try to imply or apply some sort of realism to what has occurred with the deaths of the parents, well, they were all in that church. And that building was locked up there was only one key that key was in maria's sealed envelope definitely begs the question you know how did all of this happen and also apparently rosa was also there so i'm not really sure how things uh, you know necessarily went down in the previous night but i'm sure things will somehow get broken down to us probably not in the way we want to hear it or at least not in the way the battler wants to hear it. Wait, did Rosa take the full-on letter? Because that is what Rosa did. She actually went to Maria's letter and opened it up to get the key. But that was all that was, you know, in there in the envelope. I'm sure that she didn't touch the actual letter. He was stirring in his sleep. Potentially waking up whenever Rosa was in the room. I mean, there's a whole lot of things in her handbag. And that was quite the jab, but Battler vaguely remembered Rosa entering the cousin's room. Also, when Maria woke up before the rest of them, she had started rampaging around, saying that someone had opened the envelope that she had been keeping safe. Putting two and two together, they figured that Rosa had probably come and opened the envelope. But she didn't take it. She didn't take the envelope, did she? She hadn't let anyone touch it, but yesterday Maria had shown that envelope off to Battler and the rest a whole lot. So they remembered it well. God damn it, man. Please. Let's tone it down. Let's tone it down there a little bit, please, Maria. Every once in a while, the refreshing morning atmosphere was completely wiped out by the sound of thunder. It was only natural. Since the moment they'd woken up, they hadn't met anyone else. It felt like they were... Oh, it felt like only they were left, excuse me. As if the mansion had been... Uh, had become an empty husk. <laughs> Jessica called out into the hallway, and eventually an answer came back. It came from the entrance hall. Oh, Nanjo. Nanjo, 
南條先生おはようございますあのすみませんがうちの親たちとかどこに行ったか知りませんか Oh man, we're gonna get some crazy heartbreak here shortly. Hope. What is my ma? Oki te kuchira ni kita bakari desu kara na. Wakari kanemasu ga. Sate. It was only natural. Nanjo was a guest, just like the rest of them. He had come just now to pass the time in the parlor until breakfast. Actually, you know what? I want to do something. Well, actually, I I don't know. So. In the previous video, I pointed out who were two for two in dying in the first wave. But who else, you know, is two for two on the opposite side? Well, there's obviously Kinzo, but he eventually will die. There's all the kids. They definitely survive all the way up to the end. Uh, Natsuhi did not this time around. Rosa, this is her first go around living past the, the first night. Nanjo's two for two on living. Genji is. Kanon is. And Kumasawa is. This is Goda's and Shannon's first time making it to day number two here. So, I don't know if we can necessarily point fingers to see if any of the 18 are, you know, responsible. If that's actually what went down, if we want a sense of realism. But there is also that prediction, which was brought up a lot in episode one, that it wasn't a 19th person that it was somebody in the family. I just wanted to kind of, you know, stir that pot a little bit. So it does look like Rosa actually took everything, not just the key. Maria buried her face in Nanjo's plump stomach, sobbing and crying. Nanjo could do nothing but be bewildered by this ruckus so early in the morning. <laughs> From down the hall, they could sense people running hurriedly. They saw Goda and Kanun coming towards them. Normally, it would be disgraceful for a servant to run inside the mansion. And yet, Battler and the rest didn't even think to question that now. Maria's sobbing had become so unmanageable, they wanted to ask, uh, ask someone, anyone, where Rosa was. But the two servants seemed to have bigger things on their minds than Jessica, who was waving at them. Goda flew into the servant room, and when Kanun noticed that Nanjo was there, he bowed and approached the doctor at a quick pace before whispering something into his ear. Without saying anything more than that, Kanun finally noticed Jessica and bowed to her. But he wasn't calm. No, it's very hard to be calm in these uh, circumstances here. Again, Kanon is two for two in this. We've seen how he's kind of acted during all of this, both composed and a little, you know, on edge or like on edge kind of. Like it doesn't really show it. It's his character not to really show emotion, but no, he's he's got it in there. Emotion, just like a regular human. He dashed back down the corridor by which he had come, followed by Nanjo. By looking at how hurried they were, Battler and the rest realized that yes, something bad really had happened. They saw Goda through the door to the servant room which had been flung open. He was holding the receiver and violently pressing the hook. From that, they realized that he was trying to call a hospital or the police. In any event, he was trying to call someone because of a serious emergency had occurred. <laughs> Maria, for the love of Beatrice, please stop. Like, we get it. They didn't know what, but something was happening. Battler and the rest chased after Nanjo, or Kaunun and Nanjo. Ah, uh, and then we realized Kaunun Kun had called Dr. Nanjo, but he hadn't called us. So we shouldn't have gone with them. I wonder if Alice regretted her excess curiosity when she chased after that rabbit holding a clock. Well, it was a, it was a pocket watch, actually, right? I'm pretty sure that's what he was holding. But I never read it. I never even watched the Disney cartoon movie. Yeah, they, they definitely do a really good job when it comes to this part. Like, every, every time. Like, they're two for two on this, too. Just 
being fucking bad at like hiding this this you know awful scene. Kaza, Tosa, Nariga, Nariga, Taro. And I would argue, just because of how things are set up here, that this is, in a way, more gruesome and fucked up than it was in episode one. In episode one, yeah, their faces got pretty torn up and everything like that, but here it's as if they got played with, you know? Like, they got completely disgraced to a point beyond, you know... I don't even know what the fuck I'm trying to say here. Either way, it's so fucked up. I, I can't put it into words how messed up this is in comparison to the first time around. I think Battler is putting it in uh, better words than I was, honestly. I mean, we all get it. It does really suck for Battler and Jessica. The, they both have lost parents in the first go around. Yeah, for real. Najo told the children to go outside, but no one listened. Now that will, you know, create some lasting damage there. Rosa regretted her own carelessness. She should have realized that the children would eventually come here. She should have quickly locked up instead of standing around stunned. I mean, in a way, I can't really blame her. And, and even those also in episode one. I mean, yeah, I just shit on them for, you know, allowing this to happen now a second time. But, like, it's so hard to process and accept that this is happening. You kind of aren't thinking of other things going on right now. So the children had come here, they had seen it. Surely at this very moment they were having a sight burned into their eyes that was far more grotesque than the shocking meal Rosa had witnessed in her youth. While she hugged Maria, who seemed to be too shocked to show any emotion at this gruesome scene, Rosa cried for them and their parents. The four groaning and crying voices, their sadness continued to echo in a place that should have known God's love. Oh, hey, we're, uh, we're outside the scope of the story now, all of a sudden. Yeah, it's very, I, I pointed this out as well in the last video. Very chaos head or chaos childlike. Yeah, I don't know if that would necessarily help. What a face, Jesus Christ. Okay, yeah, I, I guess that's something to be thankful for. No, not no, not at all. What the fuck? No, you, you tore open their stomachs and like took out their guts and stuffed candy inside. How is that any better? そう、かよ。そいつはサービス満点だぜ、君。俺は<笑> and tidy corpses, right. Ah, okay. So that's how she's going to try and set some stuff up this time around. She's going to try and defeat the theories that Battler had come up with in episode one to try and tie it together to a sense of reality. Yeah, 
Well, here, I mean, if we could just figure out the key situation and whatever really happened last night with Rose's presence here, then we can tie it together with maybe there was a duplicate key. And, you know, everybody got murdered, had their guts sliced open, and, you know, this and that have occurred in a very gruesome way just by an actual human. I'm that like, I'm pretty sure we can still connect this specific murder to human events. This is evil. This is actually pure evil. What was that? What'd they also do like a little... You done? Why'd they also do like a little laugh track there? Okay, that was fun. <laughs> Battler suddenly yelled. His tears were still dripping down, but as though scolding himself for being a sissy, he slapped his face hard several times with both hands. Yeah, you gotta be a man, no crying. Even so, the tears still wouldn't stop. That was a joke, by the way. However, he felt a hot blaze in both his eyes. No, no, that's up to the seagulls and sometimes the Higurashi. Rather than genuine anger, maybe it was more of an evasive anger to blot out his sadness. However, it gave a little courage to George and Jessica, who had been crushed by the sadness. I don't know, live maybe? Same thing as episode one, I'm sure. Yep, there we go. And so this island has been separated from the rest of the world yet again. When she heard that the phones had broken down, Jessica immediately decided that it was the work of that mysterious guest. Her eyes were bright red after so much crying, and they began to grow even redder with rage. <laughs> Well, hold on now, actually. I have a, I have a feeling of maybe what Battler is going to want to do here. He is going to maybe... Okay, here's my prediction. Here's my prediction for episode two, which may immediately get crushed. He's going to defend. He's going to defend Beatrice. Because he doesn't want the answer to be, oh, it was magic. Because if it was magic, well, then he's failed. All of this, you know, is, is a story that we can't utilize in our fight against Beatrice outside the scope of the story. So the battler here in the story needs to stand by his ideals of which we saw in episode one and basically try and point fingers at somebody else, maybe? I don't know. Covering her uncontrollable sadness with anger, Jessica ran outside, torn apart by emotion. Thinking about it hastily, maybe the mystery guest who had arrived yesterday, Beatrice, was suspicious. However, in that instant, there was absolutely no proof that she was the culprit. At this moment, she's just another guest, no more, no less. So Rosa, making an adult decision, was forced to stop Jessica in her rash rampage. Goda and Konon picked up on this immediately and chased after her. Wait, 
誰でもいいから犯人ってことにして横っ面をぶっ飛ばしてやりたい気持ちがあるだがその前にはっきりと理解する必要があるベアトリーチェってのは何者なんだ俺は顔すら見てねえぜ Okay, we're, we're kind of going in that direction. Not necessarily defending her, but not trying to point fingers at her immediately. <laughs> Hello, Maria. You're not helping, Maria. Actually, tonight is not Halloween, Maria. Come on. It's not the 31st. Maria! The crisp, uh, the crisp sound of Rosa slapping Maria's cheek echoed through the high ceilinged chapel. Excuse me. Yeah, no, she, she deserves the slap on that one, honestly. Like, no, everybody is in high tensions. Uh, maybe not deserve, but it's kind of expected that she's going to get hit. High tensions, high emotion here. Ever since it started raining yesterday. No. Ever since this island was swallowed by the typhoon, I have felt as though something was wrong. It was bright and sunny when I arrived on Rokinjima, but since I had gotten up early and was sleepy, I took a nap. When I woke up, it had already started raining. And ever since that time, suddenly a mysterious visitor calling herself the Golden Witch Beatrice arrived, and it felt like I was sinking bit by bit into a bizarre world. What the heck happened while I was napping? Am I supposed to believe that this island was sealed off inside a different world where common sense doesn't apply? The story really does go to show you how humans can be broken down so easily if put into insane environments such as this. Who is this person called Beatrice? Is some unknown person trying to invoke themselves with the inheritance problem just like our parents were freaking out about at dinner last night? Or is the culprit this witch from... Or is this culprit, or is the culprit this witch from the Legend of the Gold, just like Maria said? Sorry, guys, I had like a big ass brain fart there. Even if we set Jessica's temper aside, given the circumstances, it's probably safe to say that this visitor person is the most suspicious. But we mustn't make up our minds based on that alone. Ah, it's useless. It's useless. It's all useless. I smacked my face with both hands again, cooling off my brains before they overloaded. Even though it might have been a wasted effort. Where'd you find that? On a tray piled up with sweets that decorated the table, George Anaki found a western envelope that had the Ushiramiya family crest done on it in gold leaf. And it was unopened. その推理は正解のようだよ。書いてある。残され者たちへって。Oh、lovely。それは犯人が残した手紙なの。中身は。Probably oh, a letter. silently, George Aniki broke the seal. A folded letter came out. Hello. God damn, let me get a drink. Um, okay, that stood out to me. That letter really was a joke. This Beatrice, who called herself the family alchemist, had announced that she was collecting the gold that she had lent grandfather along with interest. So it's the same letter. It's the same letter that we saw in episode one. Maybe a little altered here, but uh, pretty much the same idea. And that interest was everything Grandfather had created. Since this tragedy was right before our eyes at, as this paragraph was being read aloud, well, it clearly wasn't referring just to the wealth that Grandfather had built up. It was literal. Everything that Grandfather had created. In other words, all of Grandfather's descendants were included in the interest. <laughs> Okay, there we go. 
Still denying the witch, you know, the witch idea, as expected. Which, you know, easier said than done. That means we have to solve the big ass riddle here. つまり、こいつは魔女様の挑戦状ってわけか。黄金の隠し場所を記した暗号文を解けるものなら解いてみろと。そしてそれができなきゃ、西の回収をこの後も着々と進めていきますと。ぶっ殺してやる。上等だ
It definitely wasn't a knock. That sound was the beating of her anger's hammer, as if she was determined to break the door down if it wasn't opened. Honestly, in episode one, Natsuhi was still alive. She still was, uh, uh, she being Jessica, was still definitely under the wing of a parent. So Jessica no longer has those restraints. So she's going to, she's going to go all out, I guess you could say. There was no answer. Jessica grabbed the doorknob without any reservation, but she felt the resistance of the lock. She turned around to look at the two servants and spoke. Although Gota was flustered, he still tried to somehow calm Jessica's anger. After hanging his head silently for a while, Kanon pulled a master key from his jacket pocket. Well, yeah, Kanon doesn't give a shit about Beatrice. Yeah, a satisfying explanation. Jessica snatched the master key from Kunun's hand and violently shoved it into the keyhole. Immediately, there was a small sound and she felt the lock click. Then, without asking permission, she flung the door open. Here we go. Jessica rudely stepped into the room. The witch wasn't anywhere to be seen. Wait, so she locked the door on the way out? Jessica, thinking she might be hiding somewhere inside the room, peeked behind the curtains and under the bed, but she couldn't find anyone. However, there definitely were signs that the bed had been used. And though it was only a vague sense, the atmosphere in the room felt a little soft. It wasn't the hard atmosphere of a place normally devoid of people, like the chapel. You could definitely tell that someone had spent the night in this room, but she could not be seen. In reality, neither Jessica nor Gota had met Beatrice. They had only been told by those who had met her that she looked like a double of the character in the portrait. So they were doubtful about what her face really looked like. However, Kanon alone had met her. He understood what kind of being that witch was, what kind of personality she had. So he knew that forcing their way in here in search for her definitely wouldn't work out. She must be watching us bitterly flail about in vain from somewhere, sneering at us. She's that kind of person. So I guess Kunwin felt like, okay, let's get the show on the road. He already knows that, you know, jumping on into this room by force, nothing's going to really come of it, but it will move things along. Because he was looking at things that way, Kunwin was the first to find it. The other two were concentrating on finding the shadow of a person, so they didn't notice. Near a water jug on the side table, there was a single sheet of letter paper. On it was a short message, and nearby was a fountain pen, which had probably been used to write it. Kanon had already come to understand the witch. After finding the corpses, they had been overcome by rage and barged in here, only to find no one, so of course the witch would mock them. You can't mock someone unless they know they're, they're being mocked. So in other words, that's what this must be. Yes, let us read it. Let us get mocked. Jessica dashed over and violently snatched the piece of paper away. She probably wasn't trying to be violent. She just couldn't control her strength right now. As soon as she read the message, Jessica went into a wild rage, crumpled the paper, and threw it. God damn it, Jessica. What the f- What are you doing? Then she grabbed a light stand by the bedside and violently swung it around, mercilessly hitting the walls and furniture with it. The light bulb was all shattered at once, and the fragments were scattered across the room. She's really putting on a show here, isn't she? This was written on the paper. 
私がぬくぬくとここであなたが飛び込んでくるのを待ちぼうけるとでも<笑>素敵な夜に粗暴なるあなたは似合わないこんな間抜けに育てた親はどんな顔 Oh, yep, there it is. うん見たよ本当にそっくりな間抜けづら、oh, yeah. 今はおかしいな顔を持ってくれたんだけど。It was the sort of thing that witch would write. It meant that she had predicted that one of the children who had lost their parents would come running in here. If she's hiding somewhere in this room, she must be rolling around laughing now. The witch was that kind of person. She sneered at people's misfortune, using it to stave off the boredom of a thousand years. Gota snatched away the light stand Jessica had been holding. After all, if she kept swinging it around, she might end up smashing it against something which could cause serious injury or against somebody. To Gota's eyes, Jessica probably looked mad with rage, burning herself up with the flames of anger. I mean, the anger and emotion, they're all completely understandable, and we saw a lot of this in many different forms in episode 1. But Kanon's eyes saw it differently. Those were probably tears of sadness hidden by rage, yeah. So, when the light stand was taken from Jessica, when she started crying on the floor, scratching at the carpet almost as though she was groveling, Gota was surprised, but Conan was not. Of course, she had lost her means of crying by lashing out in rage. At least she's letting it out. She'll eventually get past this somehow. Just gotta cry it out. Let the actual pure emotion come out instead of the rage. Considering that she was a daughter of the Ishira Mia head family, she was in a very shabby state. She scratched at the carpet with her fingernails, and even her feet were scratching. Jessica cried very, very hard. Because if she didn't, her rage would start building up again and swallow her up. But over and over again, she remembered that humiliating message. I can only imagine what the parents who raised you to be such a moron must have looked like. Definitely egging her on here. And probably the most emotional of like the the three that would actually come here, Battler probably wouldn't. So out of George and Jessica, Jessica is probably the most that would, you know, get mocked on here. To to have the strings pulled here. Oh, right. I saw them, and they look just as moronic as you. Now their bellies are full in the land of sweets. <laughs> That is fucked, honestly. This is just, uh, it is cruel, it's gruesome. It's, uh, it's fucked up, really. But you could definitely say that. Oh, she's, she's gonna suffocate. You can definitely say that all those words and terms definitely correlate with what happened in episode one, what we saw there. As Jessica cried and screamed, she triggered an asthma attack. The servants watching over her hur hurriedly ran up to her and rubbed her back, but that only provoked Jessica's wrath. <laughs> you dumb bitch. You are literally suffocating. Again, you dumb bitch. <laughs> Jessica got up unsteadily, and as her asthma continued, she went out into the hallway. Kanon had noticed. Gota, who was vastly separated from her in age, probably couldn't sense the tears, or the tears, excuse me, in Jessica's heart. Kanon, who had noticed, had to be the one to support her. Kanon-san, 
So this is. Goda also understood, and he knew that Jessica and Kanon had shared a vague relationship with each other. Yeah, vague, all right. So we understood everything and left it to Kanon. Yeah, anything to get out of this mess, huh, Goda? Kanon's voice was frail, but he nodded firmly. After looking at his eyes, Goda nodded firmly as well. Goda was a veteran with many years behind him. He had seen a great number of people in his life, so he knew the vigorous sparkle that could be found in the eyes of those who possess self-control. He had surely seen that in Kanon's eyes, so he would leave this to Kanon. When you think about it, maybe this was the first time Goda had ever trusted Kanon and relied on him for a job. Well, you know, it's rough circumstances, might as well, right? Jessica, still suffering from her asthma, seemed to be heading towards her room, though she kept leaning against the wall. Well, yeah, again, she's literally suffocating here. She's not getting the blood or the oxygen in her blood that she needs. She's definitely wearing herself out, especially with the emotion. Conan followed her wordlessly. If she had asked for a hand, he would have leapt forward and supported her. But until Jessica did ask for that, he chose to hide himself, watching over her from a distance where he could come to her rescue at any time. When people feel their hearts are about to explode from sadness and want to have someone by their sides, well, you can bet 10 billion of them would want to turn around and find someone in the place Kanu now stood. As he watched over Jessica from behind, well, then finally, she doubled over in front of the door to her room. The asthma attack had stolen all her strength and all of her air and her thoughts had gotten hazy from the lack of oxygen, making it impossible even to stand up again. But right then, Jessica didn't think she wanted someone to lend a hand. She still hadn't been able to overcome the flames of anger. Even if someone had offered her a hand with good intentions, Jessica would have wanted to tear it off right then. She knew how unfair that would be, so she definitely wouldn't ask for help until she overcame the fiery anger burning inside. Jessica had probably lost the willpower even to call for help, but Kanun heard it. He definitely heard it. Kanun definitely heard that voiceless call for help, one shared by miserable grievers the world round, an endless scream that no one ever seems to hear. Kanun quietly knelt by Jessica's side and wordlessly offered her a shoulder. Though Jessica kept coughing painfully, she accepted it, unlocked the door to her room, and entered. <laughs> Honestly, respect to Kanun. I mean, he's not the brightest, and, well, that was pointed out also in the previous video through, uh, I guess, the conversation that he had with Shannon, but no, he's, he's not the brightest. He's young and stupid, just like how I was pointing at Shannon and George, calling them young and stupid for various reasons, but... I think Kanun is tackling this in a good way. Jessica often said that when her asthma got serious enough, oh, excuse me, it hurt so bad that it felt like she had vomited up her whole stomach. Her face was pale and her gaze wavered, and yet the coughing continued. Even so, her sadness was probably even stronger. After having her sit on the bed, Kanun took off a, I still don't know how to properly pronounce this, Bronca Delator, Bronca Delator, something along those lines, from a cute little basket on a nearby side table and handed it to her. Jessica sometimes forgot to take her medicine with her. Whenever this seemed to have happened, Kanon would take notice and secretly carry around the inhaler from the first aid kit in the servant room, but he hadn't done so today. Now there's other things going on here. He scolded himself as though wondering how he could call himself furniture after failing to bring it with him on a day like this. Then he remembered the day when he'd used that word and somehow betrayed Jessica's feelings. It jarred Kanun's heart, but he felt it would be indiscreet to think about something like that considering how Jessica felt now, and he locked it up inside the depths of his heart. <laughs> yeah, we should probably get to saving her life here. When, he, when she inhaled her medicine, and there we go, we're saving her life, 
Uh, Jessica's wild breathing calmed down bit by bit, or bit by bit, excuse me, and she was finally able to regain her composure. But she had lost too much strength and willpower to get up from the bed. Well, there we have that. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, that's I that's something I totally agree with. <laughs> Conan regretted his poor choice of words. Did he really say, are you all right to her? I, I, I don't blame him. Was he really that clueless of the pain in her heart? This was what made him furniture. No, it's, again, young and stupid. I'd probably ask something similar because I, if I'm seeing somebody in physical pain after they were in, like, deep emotional distraught, yes, I'm probably going to ask, are you okay after I've, you know, helped save their life? That's, you know, I'm worried about their physical health there. This was why he couldn't become human. No, that was just, again, it's just, you know, a slight bit of stupidity. It happens. It, you know, stupidity is actually what makes us human. Making mistakes is what makes us human. That's actually, like, real as fuck. Conan understood that she still needed some time to cry alone. He told her to call him at any time, bowed, and tried to leave the room. <gasps> Jessica had spoken up as though she wanted him to stop, so Conan had stopped. If she asks it, I'll do it, or I'll do anything I can to help her. Right now, I had become even a cane or a chair if it would help ease the pain in her heart. If by doing that, I can make up for the pain I dealt to her heart on that day. For a while, Jessica stared into Conan's eyes. It was as though the, that her reason for stopping him was something she couldn't put into words. Alright, good, good talk though. For a while, neither spoke. Jessica broke that silence. With a small voice. No, you stupid bitch. There's definitely something you want to say, so say it. Damn, alright. Alright, man. No, I, I respect this. For just an instant, it looked like some kind of hope had flitted into Jessica's eyes. But it was very faint and disappeared like the first snow on the surface of a river. Kanun bowed once again and closed the door. Okay. Now that we're kind of done with all that, let's talk about that note. That note that was left by Beatrice. Beatrice is now uh, gone, and we don't know necessarily where she is. If we took the perspective of not immediately accusing her, which is very difficult for me to do. Okay, so we go along with that perspective or that sort of... Yeah, let's, let's go with that direction. We have that note. We can't determine if it was necessarily written by Beatrice, but it, if it was, well, there we go. I mean, she kind of just outed herself as the culprit, which is the point of this story, is for things to tie together as Beatrice being there using her crazy-ass magic to, you know, do what she's been doing. I don't really know how to really approach this differently other than... I mean, if she outs herself, then what more can we do? Anyways, he had thought those words of his would give her some courage. But now it felt as though they had actually hurt her for some reason. Why? He didn't know. Surely that was because he was furniture. That was why he couldn't grasp human sadness even now. As Conan repeatedly questioned himself, he walked down the corridor. He felt like the window at the corridor's end was coolly calling to him. <laughs> yes. But also, no. I mean, again, you are yourself. But if you keep calling yourself furniture, I mean, how do you want to go about life? How do you want to be seen? How do you want to see yourself? It was still pouring outside a dark gray world. Even on days like this, Shannon would surely, would surely see the ocean and know that it was blue. But to my eyes, even if it cleared up, I would only see gray. 
Until I can understand the blue of the ocean, I'll be nothing but furniture imitating a person. Uh, what's happening? Oh, there we go. I was wondering if Beatrice was going to pop up. Oh, is that so? There shouldn't have been any trace of human life in this corridor. It had been an empty corridor filled with frigid air. But those scoffing words approached Kanun from behind. When he turned around, he saw that witch. That witch who hadn't shown herself when Jessica had searched for her with a rage bordering on madness, and who had left that sneering letter to toy with Jessica. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if I need this knowledge. Okay, that's that's very literal. Okay, that's a little figurative. わかるわけもないし Oh man, that could also be taken as literal. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's not really his fault though, right? I mean, it kind of is, but also, like, he knew his place, and that's why he created a gap. But can you really blame him for creating, a, a you know, that gap? It's to save both of them. But I guess at the end of the day, yeah, you're still technically hurting the person. Oh boy. You know what? I was actually thinking in the back of my mind, like, yeah, George and Jessica, or not, George and Shannon, excuse me there, are prime candidates for the second Twilight, the second killings that are bound to pop up at any time today. But they're not the only ones here. They're not the only ones that have this lingering attraction to one another. It's been pretty pointed out by Kanun quite literally that yes, he still likes Jessica. And Jessica probably still harbors feelings for Kanun. It's that weird type of forbidden love <laughs> thanks to social status and whatever else. Admitting them is one thing, but they're still there, they're present whether or not you admit them. Jesus Christ. Damn, Beatrice is just fucking going unhinged mode this time around. Yeah, I mean, look at what happened at the end of episode one. Damn, she is evil. At that time, Kanun definitely heard Jessica scream. Oh, don't tell me. Are we already, like, getting in on... on, on Murder number two on the murdering spree on the second murdering spree of this lovely family conference. Well, I'm gonna record until I find out. When he blinked and looked down the corridor, the witch who'd supposedly been there so nonchalantly just a second ago was gone. 
At that moment, he was just standing there all alone in the corridor, doing nothing. And the person he wanted to protect was asking for help from far away in that direction. It was obvious what he should do, run away. It wasn't logical. It was an electric reflex. Without a trace of hesitation or distraction, there was a person he wanted to protect, and she was asking for help. And at that moment, he genuinely wanted the person by her side to be him. Oh, here we go. When he flew into Jessica's room, the scene that greeted his eyes was a bizarre one. The room had become a fantastical world where a blizzard of gold-colored specks danced, almost as though gold leaf had been scattered inside a snow globe. No, that's not it. I've seen this spectacle before. This isn't gold leaf. It's countless golden butterflies, Beatrice's minions. Well, we're gonna die. Jessica was surrounded by countless butterflies, waving her hands around, trying frantically to drive them away. Oh, not this shit again. Conan rushed towards Jessica and violently brushed the cloud of butterflies away. The butterflies, which were sickening despite their beauty, surrounded Jessica's face, trying to crawl in through her mouth and nose. Jessica choked violently, almost as though the butterflies were triggering an asthma attack, mocking her. But when Conan ran towards her, the butterflies stopped attacking and began to dance an elegant rondo around the pair. What the fuck? What, what strings are being pulled here by Beatrice, I wonder? As he stood guard in front of Jessica, who was using her inhaler and seemed to be in pain, Kanon yelled into the empty air. Oh, there we go. Things are about to get death. And when he dead, or when he did, not dead, well he's gonna die, but the empty air did indeed laugh back, satisfied. Well. Oh, hello. Then she showed herself. It was, it, it wasn't in response to Kanon's demand. It was obvious because peering and sneering would bring them even more humiliation. And plus, it was more fun. <laughs> duck with green onions, huh? <laughs> I've never had duck. Or green onions. Oh, is how that is is that how that all goes? She snapped her fingers with a piercing sound. Yeah, bring on the death butterflies. But she or when she did, a blizzard of gold butterflies was stirred up, and they began to form a small mountain as they whirled around in a circle. It was just like the swirling of a cold, wintry wind that builds up a mountain of leaves. Uh, what the fuck are we looking at? From that mound of gold, a hand sprouted and it appeared as though a resident of the world below was crawling up from beneath the ground? What are we looking at here, actually? Who the fuck is this? This is... This is not a person we've met. They've got fucking... They've got muscles, they've got pecs, they've got, you know, some girth to them and facial hair. That doesn't match any description that which we have seen out of a character thus far. <laughs> Jessica couldn't comprehend what she was seeing right now, and her mouth kept flapping open and closed. It was the bite of wisdom, seen in those trying to understand something incomprehensible. What the fuck? Okay, yeah, I guess... <laughs> I guess that really isn't a person that we've seen before. Um, I think I was still nowhere near the right track of what this could have been. It's not even a person. 
That thing crawling up was probably an attendant who served the witch. It reappeared, or it appeared, not reappeared. It appeared to be wearing a uniform suitable for one who served. But its face was wrong. You don't say. It looks strange. You really don't say. It was covered with pitch black hair, breathed rotten breath, and its eyes were filled with the same strange subterranean glow as lava. And to symbolize its non-human status, it had two horns. It was the figure of a goat-faced attendant who served the witch. I think I saw something like that back when I played Catherine. By now, Jessica had no idea what she should say. All this happening in front of her couldn't be explained with common sense, and she couldn't do anything except open and close her mouth. Jessica had not realized. She hadn't realized that this island had already been cut off from the rules of our world, but there were some things even she could understand. This goat attendant served the witch and was after her life. And apparently, the witch had already given it the order. She was looking at Conan with an expectant gaze. She looked at him with an expectant and therefore challenging gaze as though asking him how he intended to protect this maiden. Though the attendant had already, or had looked especially bestial while crawling to its feet, you could see in the way it carried itself that it possessed more than enough grace to be worthy of serving the Golden Witch. And you could tell that it was overflowing with the joy of furniture wanting to meet its master's expectations. Wasn't it Shannon that was playing the role of a human? <laughs> the goat attendant made what seemed to be a silent, respectful bow. Was it directed at its master, or was it offered to Kaunun as its opponent? Or its opponent. And then, on the attendant's hand, a blade of wicked malice appeared. Jesus. Alright. Nope, this is getting really... Chaos head like all of a sudden. Pulling out the fucking D sword on us. Jessica had been unable to understand what was happening before her eyes for a while now. All she understood was that this glow in front of her existed for the purpose of ending her life. And right now, that was enough. Kanun spoke quietly to Jessica, who was hiding behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder how long that protection is going to go for, though. Oh, he gets a D sword, too? Does he? I hope he does. Come on. Oh, okay. No, that works. <laughs> Interesting. Damn, even to the end of, even to the end, you know? He's just thinking about the work. What the, what the fuck are you talking about? What? Wait, you're telling me that this is... This is something that Kanun actually had prior? What fucking, like, sci-fi bullshit is, you know, suddenly occurring here? Sinniatski I mean, you could really try. Depends on the rock, depends on the throw. Yeah, I 
月を砕くことなどいだらないだから僕は Did he? Oh, okay. I was gonna say, what the fuck? 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 Or, you know, Twink, you know, like Big Goat or Twink, you know, who's gonna win? The witch's words of admiration broke the silence, and for just an instant, they broke Jessica's paralysis. This really has taken a weird fucking turn, so I would not be surprised if you were. This is some weird shit. Oh, hey, he can kind of talk, not really. Damn, he got that snarl. Damn, I felt that shit. This is really odd. And not really something I had expected. Like, how could anyone have expected this? And it continues to throw away. However, I really am supposed to be thinking about events occurring here. A strand of red had been left on Kanon's cheek. The witch saw this and grinned broadly. Kanon <laughs> <laughs> How can you stay strong if, like. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the odds here are fucked. This is a really unfair fight, I feel. Demon from the underworld, or, you know, Twink from Rokinjima. I mean, what. Who, who are you putting your money on? I think. Yep, Conan's dead. Good fight. The curve drawn by the goat attendant's blade drew a large arc in empty space. Kanon wasn't there. He was behind it. What? What the fuck is this man doing? Did he really just do some weird ass fucking flash step or some shit on the fucking goat? If this battle of drawing sparkling curves was chess, then Conan coming from behind was check. And press, and press, and press, and press. Use seven moves and make it mate. Perhaps the goat attendant hadn't even been granted the ability to go into death rows. As its knees buckled and it fell over, it broke into a bunch of gold butterflies with a pop. Okay, Conan. I see you. I kind of see you. So there was no sound of it hitting the ground. Even those unable to understand this battle would surely realize that Kanun had been magnificent. <laughs> this is a fight that I really like. Nobody should have put money on Kanun like that. Like I like I kept on throwing out there, big ass fucking you know evil demon goat, or you know, boy, like <laughs> what the fuck? Anyways, all right, I am actually out of time. As much as I would like to, you know. See how this battle will pan out, and I'm sure it's still not going to pan out all that well because Beatrice has already begun her killing spree. Yeah, we gotta wrap it up. I'm just out of time. I don't want to do these ridiculously long videos again on accident or purpose because I want to be able to take everything in and properly set myself up for another recording session, if that makes any sense. Well, anyways, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this weird bullshit you know leave a like subscribe all that fancy jazz i am really beginning to wonder what weird ass shit will continue to spring up in this episode anyways i'll catch you guys in the next one take it easy